Uh, I think that uh, the last piece where we had the dancers with the females having the large gown and the process of movement, for me anyway, it was like uh, a swan. <laughs> when you watch a swan, you never see their feet moving. And in, in, as they were moving, dancing, you didn't see their feet moving. So it was just sort of like robot in a way, a movement. Uh, I, I found also very colorful. Uh, what I would like, if well, you I, could uh, bring like us some more information about uh, the very first part of the, the video that clippings that we had was about wine. And she spoke about the number of, well, we saw an array of incredible numbers. And was she speaking about the numbers that they had within their cellar? Right. So we, you know, we, we've skipped really quickly from the dance to the wine <laughs> back again. Well, that's um, the joy. <laughs> the dance, uh, your comments, if we can go back a, a couple steps for a moment, is because otherwise we'll lose your observation, which was a very interesting one. I think the robot-like quality is definitely a 20th century perception and definitely a scientific uh, uh, mind and perhaps an, a, a kind of American viewpoint towards the dance. The dance is court dance courtly dance and that's why it's so refined and, and graceful and it comes from the period. Tchaikovsky actually spent some time in Tbilisi, Georgia. Um, he uh, wrote, I believe, um, uh, The Queen of Spades here and he may have worked on, uh, he may have worked on uh, Swan Lake here and Swan Lake is very loved and, and is performed here. Um, all of the artists of uh, that time period, the 19th century, uh, spent a considerable amount of time in uh, Georgia. Uh, they were uh, in exile or kind of self-imposed exile on holiday, <laughs> uh, we might say. And Lermontov traveled along the, uh, the King's Highway and uh, died in Georgia. He died uh, protecting the borders from terrorists. Uh, he was sent out three times from the court in St. Petersburg to defend the borders from the Lesgians and uh, uh, from the Ossetians, which are Persian and Turkic groups, Muslim groups. And um, he uh, died like one of the Romantic poets in his early 30s in a duel with a major uh, in Georgia in the mountains. And he wrote one, uh, one book. Uh, because he was bored with court life and he's bored in St. Petersburg. Uh, he, he went down to Tbilisi, he went to the baths, uh, he traveled the King's Highway, and he uh, fought and died in the mountains. Tolstoy spent a little time here, Count Tolstoy. He wrote uh, two or three stories while he was living in Tbilisi. So it was a real uh, mecca for artists. Um, and by way of bridging to your next question about the wine, yes, all of those bottles are there. This was the cellar for Stalin. And it was the cellar that was accumulated of wines which haven't been touched. And of course, it predates Stalin because she said that the earliest bottle there was 1898. And that was a long tour that was conducted for certain members of the U.S. Embassy. And uh, it's a place that is not accessible. One doesn't enter into it very, uh, very easily when visiting in Tbilisi. Um, there are bottles which are uncorked at state dinners. Uh, by President Shavaradzit and uh, bottles which are taken to uh, particular, uh, you know, particular dinner parties in Georgia and, and a lot that are just kept um, as the great wines in France um, as, as memories of those particular years. Alexander Dumas, being a Frenchman, uh, traveled through the Caucasus, his adventures in Caucasia treats two chapters of Georgia. I'd like to, um, uh, to quote a couple of uh, ideas he had about the wine. He said that the scenery in Georgia is majestic, and that's very true. We didn't, uh, in this view, get as much of a view of the snow-capped mountains, but it's magnificent, and he calls it magnificent. He says that the garden province of Kakedia and the vineyards of Georgia, which you did see a little bit of, um, whose wines would rival, and this is a French man speaking, would rival the best that France itself can produce if only the growers were as skilled as my countrymen in making, and especially in storing their wine. So you see, the French have always had a great deal of pride about their skill in all sorts of matters, and here he's expressing it too. He points out the fault. He says that Georgians keep wine in great jars buried in the ground. We saw that in the film, 
and if the light doesn't reflect too much, there's a photograph up here uh, of, of one of those jars. And they were buried in the earth. Uh, we also saw in the film, but it went very quickly, how you stamp your feet um, in a, in a uh, wood case, and the wine just flowed across the floor into the jars embedded in the earth. I climbed to a couple of those fortresses that we saw, and behind the fortress is a small um, uh, area which was the living residence, which was called the palace. Um, and the wine was stored in these vessels in the hillside. So one happened onto a wine cellar from the 8th and 10th century of these great uh, in other words, clay it was jars. A, it was a regular structure in the ground, right. and then in there they had the right. uh, vessels. Uh, you could think of a little bit like early colonial America where we had ice houses, since we just had some snow again and thinking about snow and ice, uh, where the ice was kept in the ground and kept in the earth. Um, so it was a natural storage area for them. And, and the only other place on earth that we really mm, see this is in Cappadocia and Syria, which is not a, a great destination uh, for us, but it comes from the Near East. He said that uh, the Georgians keep wine in these great vessels as like the Arabs store their grain or in the skins of goats or buffaloes. Thank goodness they've stopped doing that, but the Mongolians still do that, as I talked about that when we went to Mongolia. Because, of course, foreigners don't appreciate the strong taste from being stored in animal skins. He says, nowhere else, even in Algeria, even in the Atlas Mountains, have I found traveling so exhausting, so fraught with dangers as in the Caucasus. It has not changed. <laughs> It is still considered to be this way. The King's Highway, he describes as steep and torturous. Of course, the highways have improved because the Russians built a transit highway um, that goes to Moscow. You can start in Tbilisi and drive to Moscow. He said, before I came to Tbilisi, I expected to find a wild, half-civilized place, which is, I think, probably what most tourists still expect to find. But he says, I was wrong. Um, I was invited to dinner every evening. Food is very minor consideration in Georgia, still the case. They have a kind of cheese pie, which is their, their national pastime, maybe as though if one had pizza every day. And uh, when invited into people's homes, one always eats this uh, food. He says it's important thing is how much one can drink. His observation, and he says that he normally only drank water, was the most moderate drank five to six bottles. And this is still the case. He said that uh, he was introduced to several no nobles, and they, he, they were introduced as how much wine they drank. Um, I was warned about this when I went to Russia, um, and even in Mongolia, but the, the Georgians can and do outdrink anyone. But it's wine. It's uh, not, not usually vodka or, or hard liquor. Uh, and they feel it's very healthy for you. Going back to that tour, the man goes on to uh, cite the healthy uh, qualities of wine. Wines in Georgia are, are like Spanish wines or Italian wines. They're very earthy. And if they're not very earthy and very strong, uh, in that one glass will, will do because of its very uh, texture and uh, taste, um, they're very light and very young, almost like grape juice. Because they don't have, as Dumas was observing in the 19th century, the kinds of manufacture, the kinds of recipes that we have in uh, the Sonoma Napa vineyards or in any of our vineyards in America or in or in France. So, the there wines are very good, though, and they do a very good cognac, uh, which shouldn't be called a cognac. It's called a brandy, of course, because the French objected to it. Uh, but they make fortified wines as well as wine. But the red wine is their strongest suit. You. And also on the tape, we saw a section of dealing with carpets or rugs. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the contemporary term would be carpets, but in the terms of more past, rugs would be the proper term, wouldn't it? Well, rugs are often, uh, we often think of rugs as those which are very portable and movable. So something that usually is small, we think of usually as a rug. And we think of a carpet as something that is expansive, usually such as covering this room. Usually fills the whole space, right. yeah. But the terms are interchangeable. And the examples which we have here, um, and there is a book published by uh, the woman whom we saw showing us carpets, is the curator of carpets. She's the curator of the Oriental section in the museum. Um, but in that section, one of the uh, curatorial tasks is carpets. And this uh, book details all of the uh, symbols and the carpets in the collection of the museum. But of course, most of the carpets are from Turkey and Central Asia and Azerbaijan because the Persian tradition and the Turks 
have the monopoly on production of carpets in the world. And that, is, that did not transfer to Georgia, but the collections have transferred to Georgia because of the, at one time the Ottoman domination, the Arab domination, the Turk domination, and uh, the, uh, the Persian domination, the Shah's, uh, Shah Abbas, um, in, in when uh, Isfahan spread his, his arms very wide, and at that time Georgia was under uh, Persia. The example that we have in front of us is um, made is a carpet. It's made by Azeris from Azerbaijan who have relocated to Georgia over several generations, and the whole southern part of the country makes this carpet. It's called Borcello, and it's becoming popular in the market. Um, Most of their patterns or, or designs are are that as opposed to representational things. In right. other words, they're more of the Muslim, Muslim which is geometric. They're form. geometric, and if they're Persian, they're often very vegetal, uh, based on floral and tendrils and the garden. The floral, the carpets in, uh, in Persia all tend to have a, a flower and uh, garden motif and are spirals and arabesques. Whereas the ones from Turkey tend to be geometricized. And this is a, is a Caucasus carpet, as the Central Asian carpets. It departs, it participates in that with a star or flower motif around the outside. And in a Persian carpet, we would think possibly these would be the quadrants for gardens. But here they're not. It's more geometricized with flower bushes in the center and um, perhaps fountains or areas for prayer. We even have a bird flying. This is a modern production carpet. It's probably made within about the last 50 or 60 years. It's very beautiful. You see the long tassels on it and very nice weave. Uh, and it's uh, a lovely pomegranate color, as we saw the harvest of pomegranates in the film. Um, and uh, it is an example of Azeri production. There are several minorities, Muslim minorities, who live quite happily. The Armenians live along the border between Armenia and Georgia, and uh, the Azeris live along one border. Over here we have a distinctly uh, uh, Pr distinct production by the Georgians. Um, this is not produced by the Azeris or the Turks or the Persians. So the influence has not been reciprocal. And the Georgians produce for themselves only Kaleems. And the Kaleem is uh, distinguished from the carpet by its weave. It's a flat weave. Um, this is very fluffy. Uh, and this is very uh, soft and very plush. It has a, has a pile to it. Yes, this is a pile carpet. Uh, there are carpets, which I did not bring an example of, which are not pile carpets, um, which are also produced by other populations in Georgia. There is even a group, uh, which I do have one example at home, um, which is produced by the Greek, what, the remnants of the Greek. My necklace is Greek gold, though it's produced by the Georgians. And it's the first example while I was in Georgia of museum reproductions. I was there to, uh, to foster this project and to celebrate it when the Cultural Heritage Association made for the first time replicas of Treasures which are in its national Careful, museum. This will fall out of the frame. Oh, I think it'll survive. It survived all the way from Georgia Express the last time I was here. It didn't survive. We'll put that away for a moment. This is a. It, wouldn't it be nice if it had been? This was the catalog that was produced for the Georgia State Museum show to come to America. You may have heard about it. Yeah. And it was canceled. It was supposed to be in Washington. And uh, the catalog essentially indicates. Um, that it was coming to America, and it has all the treasures of the uh, of the museum, which include ecclesiastical uh, robes, uh, crosses, um, altar pieces from uh, the churches of which we saw a little bit of a remnant. Um, and for the first time, the museum is beginning. Um, I don't find this exact piece, but this is a little bit like my earrings. And this is Greek influence. And the Greeks were only in Georgia for a very short time. Very short. So it's a fascinating little element that's More being pursued. passing through, wasn't it? Well, not exactly. Georgia was Iberia to the Greeks. Prometheus, in the myth, who was tied to the rock, was supposed to have been tied to Kasbegi, the mountain in the Caucasus. Jason and the Golden Fleece. Jason found his Golden Fleece while married to Medea in Georgia. In the Republic of Georgia, which as we know to Georgia today, here's another example of something similar. Um, so it wasn't just a passing through exactly, but they did not take and they did not remain. And when Greece gave way to Rome, gave way to Byzantium, the Greek was essentially absorbed in the Byzantium. 
And Byzantium, at one time, the Queen uh, Tamara, uh, the granddaughter of uh, George, uh, had residences in Armenia and uh, dominated a lot of Armenia and had residences in uh, the capital of Byzantium in Constantinople. So there are great connections between Constantinople, old Constantinople, and Georgia. And there are great connections um, in some senses between Isfahan, because that was a time of Shah Abbas's domination. So Georgia is very rich in its cultural threads of connection because of this dominance by other, uh, by other um, countries. It's quite extraordinary. Um, they had to be good at living with other groups, so to speak, and yes, intertwining. And yes, and the Armenians are known uh, for their negotiations and mediations uh, with uh, their, their dominant uh, rulers from outside. Um, the Georgians have always been very hospitable and very fun-loving people, and I was hoping to show in my selections um, examples of, of family life and the love of wine and feasting and dancing, uh, because this continues, and of song, uh, of which we heard a little. Uh, again, if this works, we can listen to a little more um, as background. Um, and, and this is true, the singing and dancing and song uh, is very much a part of uh, the culture. What about this gown that's over here? That is Queen Tamara's, and that was uh, done uh, and worn by an actress in an opera. And, the uh, crown goes yes, with it, obviously. Yes, and uh, in a little bit of footage that we didn't succeed in getting into the tape, uh, there was a portrait because I traced all of the residences of Queen Tamara. Queen Tamara was like um, uh, uh, Catherine in Russia. Wherever she decided to stay overnight, she had a palace built, it seems, because uh, I must have been in at least 20 places that were residences of hers. And three of them are in monasteries. So this is from the opera, which uh, is, is still on in Georgia. This is Christmas, and the, um, the Mexicans have something similar to this in the paella. But this in, is the Christmas tree of uh, the Georgians in Mingrelia. And I was in Mingrelia. That party that took place with the singing and dancing um, with the two foreigners was in that area. Um, and this was a Christmas tree. And you put apples uh, on it, on the top. This is the felt, um, when we saw felt production and we saw this actual piece in the film and a couple of other examples. This is still made by people in the mountains who are sheep herders. And it's also, like the Kaleem, original to Georgia. These are transplants and they are still made by the people of other countries in Georgia. Um, and then there's a couple of it's other little pressed, examples. It's like paper pulp in a way. If I can move, if the camera can follow me. Um, over here is something that is rather impressive. This is for a, a bit, whoops, I just lost my, this is for a baby. Um, but men still wear these. It's called a burqa. And uh, it's small because it's for a baby, but you can see it fits me, whereas the other ones are very huge. And it's a beautiful example of uh, the, the fleece made. And I got this in the mountains uh, during a festival. And in the winter when you go, you can actually still see the shepherds dressed in these because it's uh, their outer wear. As in Mongolia, the women um, and men wore these as, were felt as boots. Could you tell us something about the other three paintings on the wall? Well, this little painting I brought along because, again, it shows the cultural life. There you have the bowl that we saw that is often filled with beans because beans is a staple um, in the country. And the pitcher is for wine. This is an observation Dumas made, too, because we have, as we had in the uh, film, the wine being uh, drunk. I didn't bring the large ones, just the small ones, so it wouldn't break uh, for a child. Drunk this way, you saw the toast that was made. And they still use these for drinking at festive occasions. Oh, yeah. And they pour the wine because it's often gotten in, in large jars from the vineyards. It's not put into bottles uh, for family use. They bring it home uh, like a cake, a beer, say. It's served at a large party here in America. Uh, they bring it home and they pour out the wine into this pitcher, which to me was very unusual. But if you think of it in Italy and France, oftentimes um, the wine can be served in the pitcher as well. And it's even caught on, I noticed, in some restaurants here, a little glass. Um, uh, carafe or, or pitcher with the wine in it. And the grape skin is uh, the residual from uh, making wine. Uh, it's made into a sticky paste and it's stuffed with chestnuts or walnuts. 
and it's very tasty and it was being sold by the road. It was also shown in the, uh, in the film. Um, and that little one there, that's the uh, two children. We looked at, we looked at uh, the, the photo, which was in an exhibition actually, and I, since we didn't get a chance to see some of the churches, I, perhaps the camera can pick these up. I'll hold them in my lap. Um, this is Vardzia, which was the um, home of, uh, of uh, Queen Tamara. This at one time contained 500 caves that were in cliffs and, uh, the, and a chapel. It's just incredible. Nothing like this exists in the, in the whole world um, except um, in um, Georgia and Cappadocia. And then moving on quickly, this is a, a view on the streets of uh, Georgia. I called it Gold Leaf. Um, and looking at, this is the most famous uh, monastery in Georgia, which we had also didn't get into the film, Sh Shemonsi, which is above Sveta, um, which is uh, the earliest and, and produced all the priests. Uh, it's high in the mountains, and behind you, again, you can see the, uh, the, the um, caves. This is a, a nun nunnery, uh, and it's in autumn, and it's in another place, and yet another style of church uh, with this cross transept which is very beautiful, dating from the 8th to the 10th century and some early in the 5th century. This is San Shivilda, and it's what remains of it. It is at sunset, and we had to really uh, go through an incredible uh, journey to get here um, to this, again, um, something between 4th and 6th century uh, village. Um, this little painting up here shows uh, Javari, which we got a brief glimpse of in the, in the uh, frame, and, and painting is very common. This is out in um, Kakhetia, um, and it's uh, the cows, as the dairy products are important as well, as that cheese bread is the primary bread. These are figures that represent the old king and queen, uh, Vaxan. Um, these are leggings that the women would wear, uh, something like in Austria. Um, in the mountains, high in the mountains, with wonderful decorations. And as we're listening, this is the musical instrument, which is somewhat like our dulcimer or lute. I can't play it, it's not, and I think it's lost its tune here. But this is still played commonly. Um, and we have some example of it as well. Looks like it's carved out of one a solid piece of wood. Yes, and as we're springtime, this is a, a view from Georgia to Azerbaijan. When you stand in the mountains in the monastery, um, it's spring in the, in the desert. Um, and the desert doesn't have spring for very long. Um, and it's, it's a happy memory of that moment because otherwise it's very gray. And there's one more piece, um, which is also from the mountains. It's worn as a girl's skirt. And it has the old Zoroastrian sun, the pagan uh, religion, which is a part of it. And since we're Easter, um, these are the eggs, um, which are made in Georgia. They're made at Christmas time, actually. Um, they're ceramic, and they're colored red. They're, they have a great fondness uh, for red eggs. And an example of their pottery, in which they always put the cross. The cross is everywhere in Georgia. Um, it is Orthodox Christian um, and uh, relies still on medieval um, and earlier systems of, of belief. Um, at the same time, because of the Soviet period, has a great uh, number of atheists. So that's um, a bit of a complication, along with the trans uh, migration of the um, Muslim populations. There, there is an Islamic temple in the city as well. I think our what, time is almost. What up. is this? Oh, that's simply a felt bag. Oh, it's a bag. Yeah, oh. it's carried in the countryside. And then what's this? Is this part of it? A decoration for the wall, which is also oh. felt. And these little, not to forget these, were made by children in a workshop to benefit um, uh, children who were in orphanages. There's one here, and then there's one of the dancers up there. And since it's Easter, um, it's kind of a nice thing to uh, conclude with, to show that beliefs are shared all over the world, though a little, um, and the same images are shared. It's quite nice. That's uh, like paper pulp, just put together and then pressed in a way. Right, but it's it's uh, wool. Yeah. And it's pressed, basically. So it's um, using the same same procedure. Yes, and as I said in the beginning. Um, Quoting uh, Dr. Kaplan, uh, Georgia is a place where, both in geography and history, it's uh, a kind of crucible where Russia met the Turks and the Persians. 
And we have remaining a population that is both where the Christians and the Muslims live happily together uh, and are surrounded on borders with people who are in conflict. And what the Georgians are most known for is being able, as you suggested, to offer hospitality um, and kindness and courtesy and to, to get along with their neighbors which is a good example for all of us. <laughs> well, that's partly because of all the invaders that they've had in, so they've, they've had to deal with them. Well, they deal, they deal with them by entertaining them. If we have one minute left, there's an example of uh, the Georgians having, the, the mafia is very strong in Georgia because Kin's so strong, of having taken actually an American captive. And uh, they got him back to their place and they had a big dinner and they drank so much wine that they became such good friends that they just let them go the next morning. And this is a very good example good of how idea. the Georgians are. <laughs> 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 they didn't feel so strongly about their purpose um, that they weren't willing to, um, to, um, to embrace as brothers after a lot of wine and good food. Um, so the Greek hospitality um, and the hospitality of the Turkish people persists uh, in the Georgians. And it's made uh, a people which Mm, Colin likes to associate it with the Italians or with the Spanish and Mediterranean culture. And that's a kind of a way of translating them or interpreting them for us here in America. Janet, our time has run out. I would like to thank you for coming. Thank you. And it was sharing a with us. I would like to thank the audience for tuning in. We have had Janet Roberts with us. I'm James Carroll. Display one last uh, beautiful item from the country as we go. <gasps> Originates from the Berks Community Television Studio in Reading, PA. Airing live on the fourth Tuesday of the month at 9 p.m. Check your local listings for repeat programming. For more information about the New Arts Program, call 610-683-6440 or write New Arts Program, P.O. Box 82, Kutztown, PA, 19530 or visit the office and exhibition space at 173 West Main Street, Kutztown. Hours are Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, 1 to 5 p.m., Saturday, 10 to 2 p.m., or by appointment. 